looking at this, you know, at, at the end, seeing this one with all the tests passing and the deployment and everything, that was very satisfying. Mm. Yeah. Maybe I'll print this out and put it on my wall. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to see that. Hey, Andreas. So, um, how's it going? Very well. There you go. Good, good. So, um, as you know, I'm not a GitHub Actions expert. Uh, I'm not a DevOps or Workflows expert. Um, but last week, I was tasked with coming up with uh, an end-to-end -end test and release workflow for my client. Um, and it's a little bit of a complex scenario, not that complex, um, but a little bit complex in that the solution is deployed, is uh, is comprised of multiple services. So it's not quite microservices, but it is a lot of individual components that are developed and deployed separately. Um, so in their case, it's uh, it's an API, an Azure App Service API. Uh, there's a CMS, there's dynamic CRM in there, there's a UI that's in Blazor, and they've all got to come together. Um, so what we're doing is when we, uh, well, what they wanted is that they wanted us to be able to, on a regular basis, uh, test this full end-to-end -end solution, um, and they wanted to be able to do it automatically overnight, and then if the tests pass, they wanted them then to deploy to production. So what we're doing is that in, through the normal development cycle is we're doing, um, you know, pull requests, and on a pull request, someone will review the pull request, but we'll also run unit tests. Um, and then someone m approves it and we merge it and then we deploy to our non-production environment. So dev and test. Yeah. Um, and then this process will evaluate the, the release of the false solution and deploy it to production if it's if it's yeah. ready. So we're talking about doing uh, integration tests um, on top of like running in, in development environments. Is that right? Yes. Like we're doing like like Nightwatcher or some kind of like, you know, clicking through the screens and seeing, you know, how's it how's it working? Yes, yeah, so we're actually using Playwright for that. Playwright. When I share my screen, when I share my screen, and I'll and I'll show you how some of this works. The acceptance criteria define the behaviour. So what I've got here to test this scenario, to test this proof of concept, is a very simple solution. I'll walk you through that first, actually. Yeah. Um, sure. So I've got here running. I've got service one, service two, and a UI. So this this simulates the complexity of the environment. These are all actually very simple. Um, are these separate services in different repositories or is it some kind of yeah. monolith? Yeah, they are separate services in different repositories. Um, and I'll walk you through that in a moment as well. Um, but service uh, one is very simple. It returns a, a hello greeting. Service two actually returns world. So what mm. service one does is service one retrieves world from service two, appends hello in front of it and then returns the whole thing. Um, so if I, if I uh, you know, run this now on service one, we can see that we're getting hello world and that's actually getting the world part from service two. Fantastic. And that's just a HTTP talking to each other? Yeah, yeah, just HTTP. Um, for the purpose of testing, you know, if you have a real world scenario where you're using this, it doesn't actually matter how they interact. It just matters that they do interact, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have a chain of dependent services. So I've got a very simple Blazor UI. I've got a, a page here that you can navigate to called hello and it basically just gets that greeting from the API from service one. That's the solution in a nutshell. Looking at my Gherkin statement here, I can see I've defined the acceptance criteria this as a behavior. So the scenario is that a participant sees a greeting message. OK, and the given when then statement is given, I visit the website. When I navigate to the greeting screen, then I see the greeting message. So the first thing that I'm doing is using Specflow to generate an actual test from this Gherkin statement. So using the specfo package, as soon as I build my test project, it will generate this. So this is an auto generated unit test file. Uh, specflow is compatible with NUnit and other um, frameworks. I'm, I'm using NUnit. Um, so what's happened is it's, it's generated this NUnit test. OK. And then this is done, interpreted from the dot feature file you create where you've defined your spec. Very cool. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, so all, all I've done is I've defined the feature using this Gherkin syntax, and then when I when I build my project, the Specflow plugin plugin interprets that and yes, generates this unit test from that. Um, now, the way that this works, I won't go into too much detail in it because you don't really need to do this, but you can see that it's got uh, a definition of the feature, um, and then the scenario, and then the given when then steps. So. 
then what I've done is I'm using Playwright and using Playwright, I've defined a page object. I'm not going to go into the inner workings of Playwright here and I've got some test hooks for setting it up. But what I've done is I've created this this uh, steps file, which is um, it, it allows us to run through the individual steps of that test and using this binding and using these bindings here, I, I bind to the, to, to the unit test file. Um, and I then execute these tests based on my page object. I'm not going to go into too much detail about those now, but what we can do is we can we can have a quick look um, and see them in action. Um, yeah, and I guess so from these tests, we can see that proof of concept. We can see that it's using um, the full website. We're, we're seeing it from like a user experience. We're accessing the page. We're loading it. We're seeing the result on the page. Um, and behind the scenes, we can, we're testing you know, the services running and getting the result back to the page. So yeah, yeah cool. exactly. So we're, we're, test, we're testing the behavior here. Um, by by interacting with the browser through browser automation, which is what Playwright does. I love um, to see in proof of concepts the spelling errors. <laughs> Visit the Webster navigate. Yes, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> that's fine. that's that's <laughs> intentional, except not intentional at all. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do is uh, if I open up Test Explorer, and um, I will what I'll do is I'll debug this because uh, in my in my test hook here, I basically I've set Playwright up for when you don't debug it to just run through it as quick as it can, but to introduce a uh, a pause when it's running in debug mode, so we can kind of see what's happening. Um, now we won't be able to see everything that's happening because as soon as it validates that the message is there, the test will end. And um, but we should at least see it open the page, uh, we open a browser, navigate to the page, and then check that that message is there. So I'm you know hands off, and we can see it. It did it. It, it all happened a bit too quickly for us to see. But hopefully now we can see that the test passed. Um, and just to just to make right. sure this is uh, this is working properly, let's go into service two, um, and let's change the the message that it's returning here. Um, so currently I've got it I've got it saying world. Let's say that I come along and I change this into Danish mode. Um, how would I say world in Danish, Andreas? That is a fantastic question. Um, I'd recommend just swapping the O with one of the O with an umlaut. And, and, well, you know, well, why, don't, for, for why, don't, why don't I make it say hello, Andreas? Fantastic. Um, and we should be able to see that that is building. So we'll just test this ourselves first. So if I go to my service two, um, in fact, let's go to service one um, and let's just execute this again. And we can see that my greeting now says hello, Andreas. Uh, let's just go and I'm not going to debug them this time. I'll just run the tests. Um, so it, when it when it runs not in debug mode, it's headless. So we won't even see the browser pop up now. It will just happen in right. the back. And we can see that that test has failed. So we have exactly now the, the behavior that we want and, and that we expect. So, so far, um, just to summarize, we've got two services uh, and a UI, all of which are required working together to provide the behavior and the experience that we want for the user. We've got a test that validates that. Um, and now I need a way of coordinating that so that it can run those tests and deploy to production. So let's have a look at how I've done that. So to test it out, I've created this organization in GitHub. And there's a reason why I've done it as an organization. Um, and this organization consists of a bunch of repositories. Um, it contains service two, service one, the UI and the tests, and an orchestrator. So service one has service one, service two has service two, the UI has the UI, and the tests has the, the BDD tests. If I look right. at service one, um, I've got a workflow here that does um, a build and deploy to my dev environment. <clears throat> um, and as part of this, I run my unit tests, just like you do on any other repo. When you merge your code, the unit tests run. My unit tests in service one and service two just assert pass at the moment. So <clears throat> they don't actually do any testing, they just pass. Um, but that's just for the, the proof of concept. So service one, service two, do that, and they deploy to my dev uh, environment. Cool. Uh, service one, service two, and the UI, they all do the same thing. Tests just contains the tests. Now, because these are playwright tests, these aren't unit tests, there's no dependency on the code because they're not testing the code. So they can live on their own in their own repo. Um, and then I've got the orchestrator, and the orchestrator contains no code other than my workflow. And what my workflow does is, um, I'll, is that a, I'll zoom in so you can hopefully read it a bit better. So I've got an end-to-end -end test and deployment workflow here. Um, you'll see that uh, the on is a workflow dispatch, so I can trigger it manually, but otherwise a schedule. So this runs at midnight every day. Mm -hmm. um, 
of course it's midnight UTC, so it happens at two in the afternoon or whatever it is here. Um, actually, it's 11 a.m. Um, um, yeah, so this runs on a schedule and you can see that what the jobs do here is first of all, I build service one. And what I'm doing here is this usual GitHub checkout action, but I'm specifying the repository. So normally you don't specify a parameter, you just say check out and it checks out the code in the repo it's in. But here I'm saying check out a repository. This is why these are all in the same organization. So the, the way that you specify the repo is by the organization and then the repo. Um, so yes, so I did that to make it easier, as you said. And also this reflects my real world scenario. So in the real world, my, my microservices or my components of my solution are in the same organization. Now, so, is it necessary so, to rerun the build? Um, if you've already built and deployed to, to development, um, is it possible to take the pipeline artifact and reuse that? Yes, it is. So, so that's uh, so I mentioned that there's a few things that I want to do to improve this process. That's the first one. There's a few to dos on this. So I am I am repeating that. So at the moment, my repo, this repo here, does this already, and I'm repeating it here. So that's one of the first improvements. Is I want to not do the build here. I just want to grab the artifact from the repo. Um, but at the moment, it, it's doing it. It's it's checking it out. It's building it here, um, and then it's publishing it, and then it's deploying it. Um, sorry, it's just uploading it here. Then I've got my deploy step. My deploy step grabs that artifact. So all I'll do to improve this is I'll take this job out, this build job out, and then instead of uh, getting the artifact from from where I've uploaded it here, I'll just get it from where it's uploaded in the other repo. So then I'm deploying my service one. Uh, and I'm deploying that to Azure, um, and we should be able to see that that is at uh, uh, E2B dash. I've got these all in my uh, my go for Goldman domain. Um, so this is the UI. Um, I'm not sure what the URL is off the top of my head for the for the service, but anyway, it's deploying the service to Azure, <clears throat> um, and I'm specifying the URL here. Oh, there you go. So that's that's the URL. Um, so I'm specifying the URL of where to get service to. Then I'm doing the build of service two, same process, it's identical, uh, and then I do the deploy. Yeah. And then maybe another improvement would be to add these as um, configurations from Key Vault or something like that, where they're not hard coded into the, into the pipeline. Into the, yeah. yeah, so yeah. What, would, what I would actually do is, is configure them as environments in GitHub. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's to do number two. Um, <clears throat> same thing with service two, uh, the UI, uh, the build and deploy is in one step <clears throat> because this is this it's blazer it's easier to just use the existing build and deploy workflow for blazer <clears throat> the, sorry this one the static web apps and mm -hmm. um, so that's what i'm doing here i'm, I'm not reinventing the wheel then i run my tests and you can see that that in order to run the tests i've got the dependency of i have to have successfully deployed service one to my end-to-end -end environment service two and my ui and then i run my tests um and again, I've got my You're URL. Using run tests. OK, cool. Just using .NET, .NET tests. Test, yeah. yeah. So this is, again, using using Playwright. Um, all, all, you, all you do is you just do, you run tests as normal, which we saw through Visual Studio Test Explorer as well. So then I run my tests. And then all I do is deploy to prod. Um, and you can see that in here, I've got to deploy service one, I need to have build service one successful and the tests successful. Um, and then I just go through, repeat what I did above. So deploy service two needs uh, service two built and the tests. And then the same thing with the UI, it just needs the tests because I'm going to build and build and deploy again. Um, that's it. That's the workflow. And I think what's really cool is that um, if you look at the action, um, uh, that's actually running now for some reason. I'll go to one of these successful ones and show you what it looks like when it's when it's been successful. And that's oh, it. Yes. Yeah. So it's got all the steps, some the, all the jobs summarized here. You can see that we're doing build service one, deploy service one, run the end-to-end -end tests, um, same service two, uh, same with the UI. And we can see that when we go run to end-to-end -end regression tests, it has a dependency on the deploy of service one, which obviously also has a dependency in turn on build service one, deploy mm -hmm. service two, build and deploy UI. Um, and then we can see that if all those pass, we then deploy service one to prod, deploy service two to prod, and deploy UI to prod. And all of these have a dependency on the four end-to-end -end regression tests. Yeah, really cool. I wonder how complicated would it be to add more and more services here? If you had, I was on a client a couple of years ago where they had about 30 services, um, and this can, can see it kind of blow out. Um, mm. well, what do you think about the complicated 
like nature of adding more services? Um, well, I mean, I mean, this is obviously a very simple proof of concept in in the real world. You would probably want something like this specifically for that kind of situation where you have 30 or however many services. Your dependency graph here might end up looking uh, complicated and might end up looking a bit spaghettified. Um, but as long as logically those dependencies flow in a way and there aren't circular dependencies, you know, it's just a question of how how much of a monster YAML file do you want to end up with? It's true. It's very true. I wonder if you could uh, eventually use something like a template where it would say, okay, grab me all of these repositories and you would just have, you know, build and deploy service X and you can just go boom, boom, boom. Make yeah. That video. Yeah, that would be great. So, so some of the improvements that I want to do is I really want to take that build step out of this and put it back in the repo where the, where the, uh, where the actual component or the microservice or whatever, whatever lives. Then that way, this workflow doesn't have to have any knowledge of how to build um, that artifact. It just has to deploy the artifact. And then that way you would call an ac action in the repo where the code is. And if you wanted to do that, ideally, we could even have a configuration file that defines what repos to run, what actions from, and which ones are dependent on each other. Yeah, this is really cool. Um, I can see from this, looking at this, it actually happened quite fast as well. The timing on these, you know, a lot of these things are running in parallel, so you can get better timing. But nothing here is really over two and a half minutes. So add it up. It yeah. probably didn't take too long to run. So the, the whole run for this was six minutes and 15 seconds. Now, it's interesting you mentioned that, because if we go back and look, you'll see that there's a few failed runs here. Um, and the reason these runs fail uh, is simply because it does run too quickly. Um, and sometimes you, you'll see when these, what's happened here is we've deployed service one, service two in the UI. And oh, then I see. And the service app is still restarting or something in the end to go and then regression tests fail. Ah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's another improvement to do as well. And there's ways that we can do that, actually. Um, so at the moment, um, Playwright has a default timeout of 30 seconds. So if it's looking for something in a browser page and it, and it can't find it um, because it hasn't navigated to it successfully or it's not rendering or whatever, it will wait 30 seconds until it can see it and then it will time out and the test will fail. So what you can do is you can configure that you know, globally, but what I would probably do to, uh, to um, improve this test is, is have a bit more tolerance just on the home page because the home page might be waiting for um, all of these things to start up. So I probably have one thing that I would uh, extend my time out for, maybe even five minutes, maybe 10, depends how long it, it takes to get all of your microservices and your whole solution deployed and spun up. Um, but then once once that original first time out is done, but just waiting for that first element to show you that your solution has deployed, I'd probably you know, stick to the, the default time out there. And you, know, you may even choose to make it shorter because you may say that if it takes 30 seconds to render an element on a page, that's a fail. That's not good UX. You might even be tighter and say, make it five seconds, ten. Um, but that, but certainly in terms of waiting for that initial load, I think that's an improvement here to help these tests. Sounds good. So I mean, you were able to set up this POC. Is the next step just to redo this for the client and and, and for their product and solution? Yeah. So that's that's what I've been working on. This. So this was last week I, on Friday. I put this together, um, and this week that's what I've been doing. I've been working through porting this this concept across and, and actually implementing it in production in their environment. Um, so that's that's what I'm working on today and what I've been working on all week. And it's uh, it's quite tricky. And there's a, a you know in their solution there's a lot of uh, dependencies where um, it really makes this look like child's play to be honest. And um, there's some, some complex things. Fortunately we've got a really good team at SSW. Um, I'm getting some help from some of our big guns on that. So that's that's good. Yeah well it sounds like pretty soon you're going to be a GitHub action expert yourself and we'll be calling you in for the orchestration of multi-repositories. Um, yeah, you'll be the real GitHub Action Superman. Maybe, maybe. Certainly feels that way. <laughs> I, le I, le I learned a lot doing this. Like, a, you know, as I said, never done it before and really just feel like I kind of went in head first a bit. But yeah, I def definitely learned a lot doing this. Yeah, well, it must be satisfying to have that at the end and actually achieve the goal it was you, you worked out to get. Yeah. That's it. Not, not this one. But, you know, like look, looking at this, you know, at, at the end, seeing this one with all the tests passing and the deployment and everything, that was very satisfying. Mm. Yeah. Maybe I'll print this out and put it on my wall. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to see that. Every time you get a, a working pipeline and eventually your wall just gets bigger and bigger. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Well, thanks yeah. for showing me this. This has been really enlightening. And I think that um, if the POC out there, if we need to do something similar, we can always reference this. Um, yeah, really cool.
Yeah, yeah like I said, it's on GitHub, so you know um, anyone is welcome to look at this and criticize it, add to it, whatever. Nice. All right. Thanks very much, Andres. Yeah, Cheers. thanks, Matt. Cheers. Cheers. Bye.